Well, thank you for braving the cold, the rain, and the snow to be with us today. I know how hard it is in California to uh, do anything with weather. I'm always amused when students cancel appointments with me because it's drizzling out. Um, when, uh, you know, when you're on the East Coast, you have to brave much worse. Um, so listen, I, I really appreciate such a great turnout. Uh, there's food there, so anyone who's here, please grab some lunch. There's some chairs up here. You can sit up front. Uh, it's not class, so no one will call on you. You'll be safe. Um, and uh, I also want to thank you all for an extraordinary semester of what matters to me and why. It's been one of the best that I can remember. The talks have been extremely insightful and well attended. So stay tuned for a lineup of speakers for next semester, and we'll have that out soon. Uh, before we begin today, I just want to make one quick announcement. As many of you know, we launched the Mindful USC initiative last year. Uh, it has a number of different um, objectives, but really it's to make mindfulness practices integral to the culture of the Trojan family. And we do things with research and pedagogy. I think the most visible aspect are the five-week courses we teach for free for faculty, students, and staff. Introduction to mindfulness. We also have a mindful self-compassion course and a mind, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction course. These are courses that help us think about how we can uh, engage with um, uh, productivity and creativity in new ways and how we can think about mindfulness practices as an intervention for anxiety, for stress, for insomnia, et cetera. They've been extremely popular. When we announced the courses in the fall, they filled in 12 hours. Uh, we just announced more courses tomorrow, so you're the first to hear. If you're interested in taking a course, like I said, it's five weeks, 80 minutes a week, um, and um, it's free, uh, go to mindful.usc.edu. You can sign up for the courses today. If you wait till next week, uh, I, I imagine they'll be full by then. So, so um, please, uh, um, if you're interested, please join. And if you know anyone who's interested, please let them know as well. So um, as you all know, one of the reasons why this um, series, What Matters to Me and Why, is in its 14th year and is a national model, other universities do What Matters to Me and Why, but we do it in a very different way, is because the students really choose the speakers, the students introduce the speakers, the students produce the event, et cetera. So uh, I'm very grateful that um, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Mithra, is our uh, final speaker for the semester. And I'm also very grateful to her student, Quan Wen Huang, for uh, agreeing to introduce her today. So please join me in welcoming Quan Wen. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very happy and privileged that Dean Sony gave me the chance to introduce my, our speaker today, Urbashi Mitra, who is a professor of electrical engineering at Viterbi School of Engineering and also my advisor, who is kind and nice to all her students and a little bit strict when doing research because of her passion and enthusiasm. But when Dean Sony sent me an email asking whether I can introduce Professor Mitra during this event, I replied to him that I might not know her as well as others do in our research group because I'm the youngest, I'm the most junior member in the group. He told me that it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it doesn't need to be a technical bio introduction, so I decided to share two little stories about her. If I remember correctly, it was January 2013. And it's our first chat. Or actually, it's a Skype interview. During that day, when I was applying to USC, while still serving, serving my compulsory military service in Taiwanese Army, I was in a mission and, had, and can only had a two-day hol two holiday once per two weeks. So we tried to arrange the interview or the chat on one of my holidays. During the chat, she asked me to talk about the project I had done before in my undergrad. But I grew so nervous and couldn't explain them well. However, she said, it's fine, it's fine. And she started to talk about her own research, trying to interest me and calm me down. All the thing I remember now about the chat is that she kept speaking, talking on her research work, and I'm just only replying, uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> it's kind of impressed. So this is my first impression of her. Now, we have regular meeting, and 
here is what it usually happens in our meeting. I love to play around with math stuff and equations, and I often encounter difficulties to solve some of them. So I, I grab the sheet of paper to, to her office and ask her, uh, and, and say that I do this, this, and this, and this is not going to work. The first thing she will say is, don't stop solving it, keep doing it. Then she sits back and spend some time look at my problem, say, oh, maybe we do it in the wrong way. How about we do A, B, or even C? She knows, she really knows how to keep her students in the right track when they are about to lose hope. And that's why I really enjoy working with her. And I'm going to stop here and please join me and welcome Professor Urbashi Mitra to the What Matters to Me and Why. Okay, I'm a little nervous, so um, I apologize. I know how to talk about technical things, um, and I also should apologize because I only know how to talk with PowerPoint, so that's why you've got it here. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. It's so nice to see so many people. I see a bunch of engineers too, which is super exciting. Thank you for coming. When I had my first discussion with Dean Sony about what I should talk about, he asked me to think about uh, choices I had made, maybe difficulties I'd encountered, obstacles I'd had to face. And my first reaction was, gosh, I have been so blessed. I have had a pretty cushy life. I have great supportive parents, a relatively great and supportive brother, uh, wonderful spouse, cute kids, nothing major has happened yet. Uh, and then I started to think a little bit about what's been going on uh, in my universe lately, and I realized, actually, I have a bunch of things to talk about. And I will tell you, this, uh, putting this talk together, for me, has been a very uh, interesting um, experience of self-awareness and self-realization. There are some things that I didn't realize were themes in my life or with me until I was forced to think about them. So I'm very grateful for that. Do you need a glass? All right, so uh, can anyone tell me what this image is from? <coughs> Excellent. So uh, I'm not going to go off on a philosophical riff about this film, uh, but I, I bring it up because uh, one of the other things I've been fortunate to have is to be in the research group that I'm in at USC. And we affectionately call them the Seven Samurai. Uh, and uh, they're amazing. You can see they're rather senior. They've made tremendous contributions. Um, and one of the, the great things about having such amazing senior colleagues is they give you a lot of advice, information, you uh, learn by following. But of course, the bad thing of having such amazing senior colleagues as well, they're senior colleagues. And so in the last two years or so, we've lost three of these gentlemen, um, giants in their field. It's been a rough emotional time for my group. And in fact, I've been to quite a few funerals. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily something I recommend, but funerals like this talk are also moments for reflection. And one of the things that you realize that often happens at these events, these memorials, is that there's this distillation of somebody's life. And it's really hard not to sit there and wonder about the sum of your life at that moment. What have you accomplished? What have you done? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? And so I've been having these conversations in my head quite a bit over the last couple of years. Some of them have been joyous because if you look at some of the lives of these gentlemen, they've really accomplished a lot. They lived full lives, they had great opportunities. Some of the funerals that I've been to lately have been for much younger people and that's been extremely tragic. So this is what I've come up with. Um, I always tell my students, and uh, Kwan Wen can vouch for this, uh, if you're giving a talk, you can't really convey more than three ideas. So these are the three ideas. Uh, and I've decided, at least for the purposes of, of today's exercise, this is what matters to me. Um, truth, failure, and beauty. And I want to take you through a little jaunt through these three things uh, and my interpretation of what they mean. So it's important to start at the beginning because I think what matters to you and what your belief system is uh, is very much based upon where you were born, what your parents were like, what your environment was. 
So I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my parents grew up in India. My father grew up in a village. He experienced electricity coming to his village. He was one of 10 children. Um, he lost a sibling. Uh, and as I learned uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, until he went to college, he was a bit of a slacker, uh, which is always a kind of surprising thing to learn about one's parent, especially if they're a highly awarded, accoladed professor of electrical engineering like my dad is. Uh, after doing his PhD at Berkeley, he, uh, his second job was at Bell Labs, he was in New Jersey, and that's where he and my mom actually passed like ships in the light, liter literally. It was 1964, it was the New York World's Fair, my mother made her first trip outside of India to the United States as an India tea girl, which the first time I heard, I thought, this is so not my mother, who's a relatively serious uh, individual. She had actually wanted to become a medical doctor. But uh, at the time of her key exams, right before that, my grandfather passed away. And so uh, she ended up getting, and I, I, this is going to come out wrong, but she ended up getting degrees in sociology, which is not a diss on sociology. But it wasn't the path that she wanted to take. And it made me realize that we as Americans, or at least as much as we are Americans here in the United States, uh, we are lucky because this is the nation of the do-over. Uh, so that gives us great opportunities to have different chances to do things. But that actually wasn't true uh, in India for my mom uh, in the 1950s. So one of the challenges of being a child of immigrants, uh, and I think that's true for all of us at any stage, is that you are sort of destined to have identity crises because you're always being pushed in different directions. There's the direction that your parents want you to have because they've made sacrifices, they left their homeland, they have a notion of what it means to be X, whatever your X is, for me it was being Indian. And then they have this perception of what you are as someone being raised in a different place. And it's constant conflict. Um, but like any uh, cloud, it has its silver linings and there are benefits to being someone uh, who is bicultural. And now I find in my life I'm tricultural. Which brings me to this notion of identity. Uh, I, I listen to a lot of NPR. It's actually my only source of information. If it didn't happen on NPR, I don't know about it. So I, I want to point to a quote that I heard uh, earlier uh, in the week from uh, Isaac Lee, who's the head of news for Univision and the CEO of Fusion, which is a new cable news channel. And he's talking about who he is and what this new news channel is supposed to be about. And he's talking about his family. And I just, I love this quote. So diving into it. My mother's family is from Russia. My dad was born in Poland. His family are Holocaust survivors. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I'm now an American. I'm gay and I'm Jewish. So when I think about the census card and which boxes I should check, it is really impossible. And I find myself struggling with this notion of identity in terms of who I am and how I define myself all the time. And I face it a lot now because I have uh, two smallish children. And one of the things that the LI Unified School District asks you to do every year is to check the race of your kids. And this is an identity crisis for me every fall because I'm married to a very tall, very white Dutch man uh, who you could, guess you could say is pure Dutch. And as far as I am, I'm pure Indian. And so when you have kids who are half Indian and half Dutch, what's your primary race? And this is a question that I don't know the answer to. So on the one hand, I love the fact that how we define ourselves in this modern world is changing and evolving and becoming so complicated and that we don't all fit into boxes. And yet I'm conflicted because on a daily basis we are often asked to be fit into boxes. And the other thing that I've realized, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this because it's taken so many years of, of having Obama as our president, that it only recently occurred to me that you know the box you're in is often defined by the box that other people put you in. And I know that seems like a very obvious statement, but it's been a bit of a revelation for me lately. So one of the things that happens when you are from not the majority culture is that you're often asked to describe it, uh, which is hard to do, especially if you've been raised in a different country. And uh, even though I know there was nothing about this particular talk that was supposed to necessarily be about faith or belief, somehow that's how I interpreted it. And so I want to tell you a little bit about um, my parents. I'm probably telling you more about them than they wanted you to know. But uh, my mother's a very faithful woman. Uh, my dad lost that form of faith, but still retains tremendous faith in people, which is something that I admire. And this is how uh, it was taught to me. And so we had a very science physically based explanations of all things related to Hinduism, mostly through my dad. And this is something that I think it's important for all of us to live by, actually, to recognize that everything that we do has consequences, whether it be good or bad. And so if I can leave one point with you, this is it. Karma is Newton's third law. 
All right, so this is a little bit about where I came from. So now let's get into the jaunt for today, which is my three things. And does everyone remember what they are? Truth, failure. failure. See, you know the whole talk right now. I have accomplished my goals. So a little bit about truth. Another figure who played uh, an important role in my life was actually Wonder Woman. If you grew up in the 60s and the 70s, um, she was on television and cartoon form and in live action, Diana Prince, Linda Carter. Uh, and I thought it was great that there was this character who had such strength, superhuman power, and I have to say, looked pretty good in a swimsuit and big boots. Now, she's an interesting character. I learned a little bit more about her in terms of putting this talk together. And she, uh, she was born out of World War II, if you will. There was a psychologist who had written an article about comic books, which I guess was perhaps a transgressive thing to do during World War II. Uh, and co was commenting on the state of comic books. He was later hired as a consultant for what is now DC Comics, and his wife challenged him to create a female character, and this is who he came up with. Uh, as a combination Amazon, but also having a lot of Hellenic connections. Uh, she fought the Nazis and has gone on to do a number of other things uh, as well. <laughs> One of the other things I liked, of course, about Wonder Woman is that she had really cool gear, including the plane that you can't see, because of course it's invisible. But the other thing uh, that was something that I liked was this notion of a lasso of truth, that there was this cord, this object that you could put around somebody and figure out what the real story was. I've always wondered about the truth and thought about it, um, perhaps not as deeply as I should. I was that kid who often told her parents the truth uh, about what I was doing in college and high school, although for the record, it's very easy to tell your parents the truth when you're not doing stuff that that's interesting or very transgressive itself. But one of the things that I've learned about my relationship with the truth is that it often gets me into trouble. And this is something that I struggle with on, on a daily basis, which is how much of my version of the truth should I share and what should I do about it. I'm trying to do it more with compassion and with diplomacy, but I'll let others decide if I've been successful in that way. But it's something that's important to me. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that there's a universal notion of truth, that there's always one form of right and wrong, but I do think it's important to uh, stand up for what you believe in, even though it may not be popular and sometimes it could be dangerous. Uh, truth and knowledge, of course, is also a deep part of the culture in which I was raised. This is Saraswati, she's the goddess of knowledge. She was a, played a big role in my family, especially the knowledge part. Education was extremely important. And again, getting to this notion of having the ability to tell between right and wrong, left and right, good and bad, uh, apparently the, the mythology is that swans can tell the difference between milk and milk that's been doctored with water. So they can discriminate between this right and wrong, good and bad, etc. The other thing, of course, I like about Hindu deities is that they always come with multiple arms, which I think is the coolest thing, and I've always wished that I could have them. And uh, in my current roles, the various roles that I play, I wish I did have these multiple arms. Uh, I bring this up because uh, right now, and my students can tell you, it's very hard for me to disambiguate myself from my various roles, including that of parent. And uh, talking about parenthood is the best segue, I think, into my next topic, which is that uh, if you are a parent, you know that there's probably pretty much not a day that goes by that you don't experience some form of failure, of something that you tried to do, something you tried to get your child to do that didn't go well, or something that you thought was going to go amazingly well and you got it completely wrong. So I think about failure a lot, and I see some of my uh, current and former freshman academy students here. This is something that we talk about. Uh, when I think about failure, I don't think about it so much in terms of myself, am I failing, am I not failing, but I worry about the fact that not enough of us fail and that we don't have experience with failure. I look at my children, their friends, I look at my students who are brilliant and hardworking, but their ability to cope with failure seems to be not so great. And, and I worry about this, especially for a lot of you young people who are undergraduates here, you were super successful. That's how you got here. You checked all the right boxes, you had 500 activities, you did a thousand things, you were very good at it. And I wonder how often you have fallen and how often you have struggled because I think being truly creative and creating a great thing is dependent on your ability to get through these kinds of failures. And in fact, for what I do, which is research, research is managed failure, right? This is what I do. It's the long-term view. It takes a long time to do successfully. If it was easy to do and you could do it in a minute, they wouldn't call it research and it wouldn't be important. 
And so we struggle with this all the time, and I like this actually. And getting back to my, further, my, my first point, research for me is also about truth, finding a version of truth, finding out what the new truth is going to be, building it, creating it. And so, uh, again, I'm sorry, I have to take you back to my culture. Um, we engines know a lot about failure and struggle. We have a guy for it. This is Ganesh. And we pray to him as our remover of obstacles, which means that you know, so inherent to the way I was raised is this notion that there's going to be obstacle, there's going to be failure, things are going to be hard, and it's okay. You're gonna be one with it. It's part of life and it's part of existing. So, uh, let me bring you to my next image. So does anyone know who this is? Meredith? Okay, so Sally's gonna be very upset with you. But I'm gonna give, um, give you what you need. So this is uh, Anna Akhmatova. She was a Russian writer and poet who wrote in the early 1910s onward. Uh, she was a person for whom the Russian Revolution was not very good. Uh, her first husband was imprisoned and then killed. Her son was also impris imprisoned uh, as a form of punishment for her. She had many marriages, and you can argue whether that's uh, a form of uh, punishment or struggle uh, as you wish. Her third husband was also in prison and died in a Siberian prison camp. Uh, for a while, her writings were banned. But to me, this is just one of the most beautiful paintings ever. And I've had the honor to stand in front of it and contemplate it for a good 15, 20 minutes, much to the chagrin of the colleagues who came with me to the Russian Museum. So it's not in the Hermitage. But uh, what I wanted to do is read to you one of her poems. Now, she's best known for the Requiem, which is a series of poems about this painful time that she went through when her son was in prison and she lost all of her loved ones. But I like this one. Uh, and so here's the header. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So that's Genesis 1926. And as you might have guessed, the poem is about Lot's wife. The righteous man then trailed Jehovah's guide, hulking and bright, across a ridge of black, but in his wife, a keening anguish cried, it's not too late for you, you can look back upon your Sodom's old red towers, the square where once you sang, the garden where you wove, the emptied windows of the mansion where you bore your children by your husband's love. She turned and looked, the bitter vision burned, welding her eyelids shut with mortal pain, into transparent salt her body turned as each quick foot took root into the plain. Who weeps for such a woman, for so small, a loss in such a brutish circumstance, yet ever in my heart I will recall that wife who laid down her life, laid her life down for a glance. I like it because the translation rhymes, and I'm kind of old fashioned when it comes up to poetry. I like rhyming poetry. It comes back though to this question of truth, right? That whenever you read something in translation, are you actually getting the true essence of what the poet or the writer intended? And so that's something that uh, I also worry about in this notion of truth and how I look at it. And of course, there's a deep struggle here. Now, failure is not good just by itself. Something has to come out of it. We've talked about that. I'll talk about it again. But I think it's also important to know how to get through, pay, uh, through failure. And so this is a poem that hangs actually behind the screen of my computer. Does anyone know who this is? I think he's a rather good looking young man. So this is E.E. Um, e. Cummings, uh, and you know, he's, he's kind of a fashionable person to like, right? Because he threw away with convention, he had issues with grammar and punctuation and syntax and capitalization. But this is a beautiful poem for him that I would like you to think of when you're struggling and when you're failing. Um, because at least for me, it helps me get through it all. It's entitled, Let It Go. Let it go. The smashed word broken, open vow, or the oath cracked lengthwise. Let it go, it was sworn to go. Let them go, the truthful liars and the false fair friends, and the boaths and neithers. You must let them go, they were born to go. Let all go, the big, small, middling, tall, bigger, really the biggest, and all things. Let all go, dear, so comes love. So I should note to you that these poems that I read to you, I didn't find them on their, my own, I'm actually not that talented, but I've found that it's very important to have friends who know things because they can teach you things. And so I actually have a collection of uh, faculty friends at different institutions, London, 
Champaign-Urbana, Stanford, and we trade poetry here and there. And through that, I've learned about these amazing artists and what they've done. So we've done truth. We've done failure. These are both kind of downer subjects on some level. So I think it's important to end on a lighter note. However, this is actually very near and very near and dear to my heart. Um, I will tell you that if you search in Google for beauty and images, you get a lot about makeup and models. But that, to me, is actually not the beauty that I'm talking about. I want to talk about beauty in all things. And so I will start here. I think Los Angeles is a beautiful city. I think there are amazing things here in terms of nature. We have the oceans. We have the mountains. I also think, which perhaps is an unpopular notion, that we are a great city of culture. And I love the museums that are here. Uh, the LA County Museum of Art is fantastic. I love that we have a piece of it that's by Renzo Piano, uh, MoMA, uh, Waiting for the Broad. I remember going to the, contemporary, the temporary contemporary as a high school student. And then if you've never been, um, the Weissman Collection up in Bel Air is a beautiful gem of modern art. Uh, Weissman was a uh, industrialist. He made his money by bringing Toyotas to the United States. Uh, he married well twice. His second wife was a LACMA curator, and this house is the house that he and his wife lived in. And so you sit in their living room under Eve Klein's. There are Botero sculptures, uh, Matisse, Kandinsky, and Clay. Uh, I've never seen a Nam June Pike video installation outside of a museum, but there's one in the playroom. And so this is just a wonderful excursion. For all of you students, it's free. You just have to sign up and arrive at the appointed time. And it's a wonderful 90 minutes uh, through modern art. Does anyone know where this is? This is LAX. And right now at LAX, there's a, an art exhibit going on through all of, all of the terminals. It's called Welcome to LA. It embraces, satirizes uh, everything that is beautiful and Los Angeles. Uh, there's stuff about Hollywood. There's stuff about the nature. The photography is amazing. I go through this terminal a lot because I seem to be taking American Airlines a lot, but it's something, again, and I think a number of you will be taking planes soon if you go home for the break, that I want you to consider, to take advantage of the art that we have. LA is the city that gave us people like Diebenkorn, Gary, and Raymond Chandler. Other people touched here and made a huge impact, like the Eames. But there's other beauty here, uh, and apologies, Manny. Um, and this is something else that I think is extremely beautiful and extremely beautiful about Los Angeles. I took my freshman across the street to go see the Endeavor. Who's gone and seen the Endeavor besides the front row here? Fantastic. Okay, again, free across the street. And as you get there, you can even smell the roses. This is engineering beauty to me. This is a collection of so many complex systems that had to come together to work together. There's every kind of engineering in this object. And if you don't think there's civil engineering, take a look at the plans for the building that they want to put the endeavor in and ask me if that's not going to be a civil engineering marvel. Uh, I think it's amazing and beautiful. And again, lucky enough to be buzzed by these two uh, twice when they came home uh, before going to the Science Center. All right, I have just a few more things uh, to burden you with uh, relating to beauty. So uh, I like beautiful things around me. I'm a great fan of uh, textiles and sewing and arts and crafts. What you see at the top there is a collection of Marimekko fabrics. This is a company that's uh, out of Finland. But what you have at the bottom is another LA story, which is uh, Alexander Henry Fabrics. This is an LA company that was started by two gentlemen bachelor Jewish brothers. They bequeathed it to the father of my friend, Nicole. And now she and her family run this company. It's a true family business. Every one of the adult children does something from design to accounting, et cetera. Uh, she's one of the artists, but she's also a business person. They have great things, including a lot of fabrics that celebrate the family's Mexican culture. And for a flip side of this, I encourage you to investigate, um, and forgive me if this comes out incorrectly, Shirt Storm. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Rosetta Project, landing uh, an aircraft, well, a spacecraft on a comet. Are we getting close? Okay. So at the European Space Agency office, which is based in the Netherlands, uh, one of the top engineers, physicists, decided to do something unfortunate, which is that he wore a shirt that was sewn out of material um, of pinup girls. And uh, that fabric is also from my friend's company. 
Uh, in case you are concerned about whether they are egalitarian or not, you can also get material for pinup boys. Okay, we've covered art, we've covered some design. Beauty can also happen in the stomach. This is actually one of my new hobbies. Uh, I've been making ice cream at home, and I have to tell you, it is a wonderful, amazing experience. I was given an ice cream maker uh, at my wedding. We had it for like 22 odd years, because it, yes, it's been that long. And uh, the first time we used it, it was extremely painful. And when you read the ingredients, you thought, my god, this is a heart attack in a box. I can't make this in good conscience. But the person that's depicted here, who is Jenny Britton Bauer, is actually somebody that's, a, that, um, I can't say she's a part of my life except in, in, the, in the modern way because I've become addicted to her ice cream cookbook. But she's actually someone that I met. Um, Jenny started out as a single person in her 20s making ice cream uh, by herself at what was our farmer's market in Columbus, Ohio. My first job was at the Ohio State University, and we used to go to the North Market for all of our shopping. And Jenny had a store there that was a, a one-woman operation called Scream, because we all scream for ice cream. And she was incredibly inventive. So I'm, I'm talking 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this is what she was up to. The ice cream was, had chili in it, or it was chocolate, but with Cabernet wine. Uh, she made sorbets out of beers. I mean, for us at that time, it was extremely exciting. Uh, I try very hard, although I'm not very good at it, to not have regrets. But what I've now realized is a huge regret in my life is that if my uh, physicist husband and I had just given Jenny two or three thousand dollars before we left Ohio, we could retire. Uh, because the, the thing that I learned is that Jenny's business scream went under because she couldn't make it work, she didn't have the business acumen, she wasn't doing things properly. She had to do a lot of soul searching. Uh, she worked a lot of jobs where she learned more about food, taste, and business. And then she came back with Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream. There are six scoop shops in Columbus. There are stores in Nashville, Chicago, uh, I'm probably missing something else, and Soon, we too can get a taste of Jenny's. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because it is another part of the beauty that I care about, which is eating well and enjoying what I eat and engaging in the making of food. Um, but I also bring it up because here's another story of someone who failed, kind of epically, uh, was depressed, didn't think she was going to be able to do it, but got it together, had patience though, right? She took several years to create this new ice cream business that is now flourishing so much. And, and for that, we have to admire her. And I think, I think one of the things that's unfortunate about our time right now is that we seem to be so interested in things happening very quickly. Uh, I, my engineering students want to make apps and become billionaires doing that. Well, I don't know if an app is a real good goal in life. I'm sorry if I'm dispelling anybody's myth here. But, but the things that are worth doing often take time and patience. And along the way, there is a lot of failure and struggle. So the last piece of beauty that I want to leave you with um, is actually from my countrymen. So I'm sorry, it's, I know Dean Sony said there wouldn't be any questions or quizzes, but there are. Uh, so I'll give you a hint. He's Bengali. Does anyone know who this is? Ah, fantastic. Oh, but was that said by the one Indian dude in the room? No. So this is Rabindranath Tagore. He uh, is from the same part of India as my family, which is known for being um, very artistic, but also very communist. Uh, it's uh, not one of the wealthier states, but uh, he was an amazing man. He, he too, though, although he created much and was a, a tremendous individual, started schools, etc., he, like me, came from a relatively cushy life. So uh, his family were business people. They made money through trade. Uh, he's, the, the epic story about him is that he goes to London in 1912, and at that point, he meets Yates. And Yates just thinks he's the cat's pajamas, which he is, and helps uh, to publicize um, his poetry to the rest of the world. Uh, the story goes that he actually lost the manuscript on the train. It was found at a lost luggage place. And then the rest is history. He's uh, a Nobel laureate. In fact, if I'm getting this correct, uh, perhaps India's first Nobel laureate at that time, um, which was in 1913 or 14. And he is credited for getting the Nobel Prize in Literature for a series of poems that he wrote. And these are, um, well, you're told that they're religious poems, 
uh, the title of the book is Gitanjali. I don't know if I would read it that way, although one of the things that I read about people's interpretations of um, translations of his poetry, it's like looking at embroidery from the back. I can't read or write my, my family's language, which is disgraceful, but someday I hope to read them in the native Bengali. So uh, I wanted to end with Tagore for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm gonna read a part of one of his poems, but the other reason why I wanted to end with him is because for me, he was part of my struggle. My father is a huge fan of Tagore and t collects Gitanjali in every translation that he can find. I grew up with this bookshelf of Gitanjali in Russian, Lithuanian, Japanese, every possible language, and my dad travels a lot. Uh, and I stole his English copy when I was a grad student, and I carried it around in my book bag. And whenever I felt like I was struggling, I would pull it out and read it. And it would sort of kind of edge me for it. It reminded me of my family. It reminded me of my dad, all the things that he had overcome growing up in this village and becoming this amazing professor of electrical engineering. Um, I, as you may have figured out, I do what every good firstborn Asian kid does, and that is follow in their father's footsteps. The only difference is that I'm a girl. So, um, so let me leave you with the first stanza of this poem that is actually one of my favorites. It's not part of the Githanjali collection. Um, and you're gonna think I have some uh, fascination with love based on everything that I read to you. And perhaps that's a good thing too. So anyway, this one's called Unending Love. I seem to have loved you in numberless forms, numberless times, in life after life, in age after age, forever. My spellbound heart has made and remade the necklace of songs that you take as a gift, wear around your neck in your many forms, in life after life, in age after age, forever. So I've spoken too long, but let me just tell you that this is what matters to me, and hopefully now you know why.